This is Jocko Podcast number 125 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And we are bringing a Q&A today sure. to the world. First sure. quest. Dang, right into it. Okay. All right. What is the difference between an excuse and a reason? Hmm. Kind of a good question, right? Sure. Okay. And the reason it's a good question because there's there can be legitimate reasons why things happen. Yeah. Right? And so for instance, you're in a in a sailing race, right? In a See? sailboat. Sure. And the mast snaps in half. Now you don't win the race. Yeah. But I mean, you didn't you know, the mast snapped. Yeah. What can you do about that? Or the weather's the horrible weather rolls in and you can't launch your aircraft so you can't go on your mission. Right. Well, you can't control the weather so you know like what's up? How can that? That's a reason. Or you get really sick so you can't compete in a competition. That's a reason. You know you were sick. Or you do bad because you were sick. and you, It's a reason. Could be called. Now, now you could look at the situation and say okay if I'm going to take ownership of this did I properly test the mast? Sure. Did I? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Did we have a ground-based plan for the operation in case the weather came in, we were going to take vehicles instead? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That would work. If you get sick before the competition, maybe you ask yourself, were you resting properly? Were you eating properly going into the competition so you wouldn't get sick? Mm. You could address that. Correct? Yes, sir. So you can still take ownership of things even if the initial reaction is like, oh, there's, you can't control that. Well, you can influence it. You can mitigate it, right? Now, can there still be legitimate reasons? Y- yes, there can. And for me, the, the, the difference, the line between an excuse and a reason is a reason you have zero control over. Right? You, have ze- you just have zero control over something happening. Well, that's a reason. Did I tell you I was almost late the other day for something? <laughs> uh, no. Because this is borderline. This is borderline. Uh-huh. I had an appointment at 10 o'clock. I left. My, it was a 20-minute drive. Mm-hmm. I left an hour. I left at, well, I left about 9, 10. I left 50 minutes mm-hmm. to drive 20 minutes. Right. St- just so going to make it on time. Yeah, yeah. I get on the road, basically a couple roads out of my house, and the one entry way to get on the freeway is locked down. Locked down. Mm-hmm. Like incident, like isolate some incident. Incident, went on uh, kind. A, a guy trying to kill himself okay. on a bridge. Yeah, yeah. Shut the road down. Incident, yeah. So no one's going on the highway. So what is it? Everyone's being channelized into... Marginal, what are they called? Back side streets. Yeah, yeah. Rerouted. Detours, rerouted. Detoured. Yeah, yeah. The clock is ticking, and <laughs> and I made it. Right, I made it. I was four minutes. I had four minutes to spare. So instead of it taking twenty minutes, it took whatever forty six minutes. It took more than twice as long. Mm. That that could be, you know, a fairly Legit. legitimate reason. Mm-hmm. Now, luckily, I had I always, you know, I, I had planned that there could be something out of my control and it might take even longer. And that's why I leave early to go to an appointment or a situation like that. So I could have also checked the traffic prior to leaving and taking a completely different route. Mm-hmm. That would have been, I blame myself. Yeah. So even in that situation, I'm kind of, I, I was thinking the whole time, what, why did, it, why didn't I check the traffic before I left? I knew this could have happened. Mm. So, anyways, in my opinion, an excuse is when you blame something that you could have controlled, and a reason is something that you have absolutely no control over whatsoever. You know, you think like a legit disease. I mean, sometimes people have, they just don't, you can't control that. It happens. But I think, and I think this is the important part, I think that what you will find, especially when you approach the world with an attitude 
of extreme ownership, and that's that you're not going to make any excuses, you're not going to blame anyone else, is that you actually have a lot more control over things than you think you do. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. When I go to the airport, I get there really early Mm -hmm. because it's something that you have no control over. You're going to stand in that TSA line, and those people are going to take forever, and that's the way it is. And if you want to get mad at them, it doesn't matter. You yeah. can't. You can't control. You cannot control it in any way. You can stand at the back and my flight's leaving in thirty minutes, and they'll be like, "Whatever. You should have showed up earlier." Yeah. You can't control it. So in those situations, how do you control it? You show up early. You take ownership of it. You show up early. You don't just. Oh, I don't know what happened. The traffic was bad. I mean, it's there's a million excuses you can give. Yeah. If you get that attitude where you're not going to make excuses, you'll actually take ownership of the things, and then you'll actually solve problems before they even happen. If I'm going to an appointment and I have the excuse in my back of my head that, you know what, if I'm late, I'll just say it was the traffic, I have a much more (laughs) increased chance of being late. All right, so what's that's, that's one of the things that makes extreme ownership hard is it hurts your ego. It hurts your ego. It hurts your ego to admit that you have control over things that went wrong. That's that there. It's your fault that hurts your ego. Yeah. It's also effective because of that. It's effective because you solve problems. Like I said before, they even happen. You solve them because you take ownership of them. Yeah. Yeah, man. But isn't this just a bunch of semantics, though? Like excuses and reasons. Real, because really, when it comes down to it excuse is like an excuse like you're excused like the reason is a reason for sure but it's like well that's what this whole conversation yes it is about semantics and the semantics are for me an excuse is something that you could have controlled and a reason is something that you could not control aren't they all reasons so it's up to i mean again look you say tomato i say i get it but come on hey you brought it up so you okay so i remember when i when i was in elementary school you get, you come late to school, you get in trouble unless you have an excuse. Now, with it's there's a difference between, and I'm saying in the in the field in in class, right? You come you come into class if you have just your own excuse, like oh my you know dog ate it or well, I don't know that's for homework, but whatever. That's different than if you have an excuse slip, which is an official slip. You know, your parents right. or your whatever, I'll, you I'll went support, to the office. I'll support and all this stuff. your movement to get excuse slips changed to reason slips. Right, right. Because exactly. that, right. that's what it is. It's yes, a legitimate yes, reason. Exactly. The kid had chicken pox, can't come to school. Yes. You can't come. Yeah. You, there's nothing. You got chicken pox, that's what. That's what. That's how. Yeah, that's how. So, but now, <laughs> given that, now aren't we just talking about a very, sp- like a standard from case to case? So, like, let's go back to elementary Dude. school. Bro, bear with me. You want to get to the bottom of this? Okay. I'm telling you. Okay. If I'm you, on by, if I'm your parents, by a thread. <laughs> by a thread. <laughs> if your parents had car trouble, right? Yeah. Is that an excuse for a nine year old? For a nine year old? Yeah. It is. It is a reason for cool. a nine-year-old. So that falls on the hierarchy of standards, but within the standard of being a, quote-unquote, legitimate excuse, right? Because that's really what it is. So a reason, in your case, in your Yeah, a reason is a legitimate language, excuse. A legitimate excuse. Yeah. That's a reason yeah. in, as far as this question goes. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I yeah. think I, I use the word legitimate. In, yeah. in, in this I was, when I was talking about it. Yeah, yeah. And so using the word reasons rather than excuse is just like, okay, let's make the language more simple rather than, because if you have an excuse, if you have an excuse, that's an ex- that by its very nature, by its very definition, you're excused. It's an excuse. You're excused from for, for being late or being late to your appointment, whatever. But if it's, it's weird because if someone else gives it to you, gives you the excuse like you're excused hey hey the guy was about to commit suicide i get it man you're excused kind of thing it's like that's an excuse in this case a legitimate one but if you give it to yourself that's the excuse that nobody likes right like hey man traffic oh you should have prepared for that yeah hey man my you know whatever was going on and this and that oh man you got to prepare for that see what i'm saying yeah I guess so. So there you go. I'll so, go with it. So reasons and legitimate excuses, same thing. Yeah, I'll give you that. You could have said that like four minutes so ago, but we'll go with it. I'm just saying you got to explain these things because <laughs> sometimes they're hard to understand. I'm telling you. No. See, 
the more you talked about it, the less I understood no, it until no, no, you no, said no. the last thing. <laughs> I had to sum it up. Okay. See what I'm saying? The summary was great. I'll give you a, thanks, bro. a B plus on Come the on. summary. All right, bro. Thanks. I'll take it. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Jocko. Hindsight is 2020. But here's a crazy thought. North Korean soldiers would have ended up with a better life like South Korea if they did not fight as they did in the 50s. When should a soldier question his leader's values? That is not a crazy question at all. And the answer is very straightforward. A soldier should always question their leaders, not just their leader's values, but their leader's plans, their leader's strategies, their leader's vision. You should question everything that your leader is telling you. And if you see something is wrong, then you should raise your hand and call it out. And I would say not only is it something that you should do, it's actually your duty. It's actually your duty is to raise your hand as a soldier. And I'll tell you, this doesn't only apply to the military. It applies to any organization. And it might sound like I'm encouraging um, mutiny or rebellion, but actually the opposite is true. If you have a team that questions the leader, the leader doesn't become weaker, the leader becomes stronger. If he's a good leader, if he's on the right path, if he's doing the right thing, he becomes stronger because everyone starts to understand why things are happening. They understand the vision more fully. If the leader doesn't have a good vision and he's getting questioned and he can't answer the questions, yeah, he might have a mutiny on his hands, but it's not because the people are asking questions it's because he doesn't know what he's doing. So the, the leader can't see everything and he can't solve every problem or have every idea but the collective mind of an organization can make that happen and that's why as a leader if I'm in a leadership position I want my subordinates to question me I want them to question me and like I said if I don't have a good answer I either need to find one and if I can't find one then maybe I'm actually doing something wrong that's entirely possible and now from a, if we want to talk about like a moral or an ethical perspective, then absolutely. And there was a group of high-ranking soldiers in Nazi Germany that tried to kill Hitler. And unfortunately, they failed, but they did the right thing in, try, in trying to kill him. They did the right thing. Like not only did they question him, they, they knew he was wrong. And they said, okay, we're going to kill him. Now, do you put yourself at risk when you ask these questions? Because I'm sitting here saying, yeah, I want my subordinates to ask questions. There's people that don't want their subordinates to ask questions. Not good leader. Not good leadership. That's not a good way to lead. I'm sorry. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, and it, so, it, so there's a risk because if your leader doesn't want you to ask questions and you raise your hands and ask a question and you do it in an untactful way and you do it in a way that offends your leader, well, then you might end up getting fired. Or if you try and kill Hitler, you might get killed yourself because that's what Hitler did. Mm -hmm. After his assassination, his he went and killed a bunch of people, including Rommel, his best general, because he thought he was involved in it. So you, you're definitely taking a risk, but then you have to ask yourself, what is the alternative? So in a moral or ethical situation, what's the alternative? And I'm not saying there's no alternative because sometimes maybe you'd be better not trying to kill Hitler but rise in the ranks and get to a situation where you can have more control and mitigate the damage that he's doing to the country, right? That's mm -hmm. a possible consideration to take. Maybe you say, okay, you know what, Hitler, I'm going to be your guy and I'm going to you know, I'm gonna do things so that way you can rise up in the ranks and be in a position where you can stop his bad decisions. As opposed to if you try and kill them and you fail, you, you, you know, I mean, obviously once you're dead, you don't have any influence over the organization. Same thing if you're in a business where there's something going on and you want to raise your hand. And yet if you raise your hand, you know that there's a risk that you might either A, get fired or you might get demoted or you might get put out of your leadership position. And now you're letting down, now, well, now you can't have an influence over the scenario anymore. So that's, that's something to consider as well. Takes a significant level of moral courage to stand up in those situations and you have to be tactful I think that's important to say you have to be tactful you have to have you don't walk in and just start questioning your leadership immediately you have to build the relationship for us first you have to grow your trust between each other and then once you have that you can then tactfully bring up questions and try and get 
to the bottom of why things are happening or why things are being done a certain way or another way. Mm. Question your leadership. And if you're a leader, don't get offended when you get questioned. Be happy. Be happy. Even when your kids do it. Even when your kids do it. Especially when your kids do it. Yeah. Because you always want to take that easy out. Just do what I told you to do. Yeah, yeah. Do what I I'm say. I'm the dad. Way. Yeah. It's it's different than it's yeah, not what I said. Yeah, okay, you true. caught yourself. Yeah, I totally. like that. Oh, dang. <laughs> Self policing over there. Yeah, that's totally Outstanding. <laughs> the, what about when they always add the kids when they always say why and then here's the thing you got to be careful. Of. I'm speaking from experience. Mm -hmm. You know how you know the old, this is old yeah, school. Yeah. Like oh why oh because of this why yeah. why yeah, yeah. why and then. It gets fun to them just to say why. For they sure. don't even want to know why. Now it just becomes a game. Then what? Just shut it right down. Well, no. That's when you should. You this just is... keep, oh, it's me against you now. Oh, no. What? Just just go jujitsu on them. Hmm. You, they ask why, you ask them a question back. Why do you think it goes that way? <laughs> and then they'll say, well, I don't know. Well, why? Why don't you know? Just yeah. just one sweep. Yeah, just a yeah. mental sweep. Oh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, that's, that's a good. good one. Yeah, that's real good, actually. <laughs> Speaking from experience, I got four kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Thank you for that. Next question, Jocko. You say jujitsu makes you humble. Why do some jujitsu instructors and many jujitsu practitioners act like complete arrogant jerks? Oh, Damn. yeah. That's a good one. That's a great question. And we haven't really talked about. Have we talked? About, I don't think we've talked about that. Now Ooh, I've yeah. talked about how. Um, some like is there's bad there's bad apples in the jiu-jitsu community for sure but the way that the way that i talk about the jiu-jitsu and the way we talk about it like everybody that does jiu-jitsu should be some buddha like enlightened being at one with the universe <laughs> and totally free of any ego right because yeah. that's what we talk about jiu-jitsu but um like i said i've talked about the fact that there's definitely bad people in jiu-jitsu and that's why you need to be careful when you're, you know, jujitsu should not be a cult. You, you, you should not be worshiping your instructor. Mm -hmm. Your instructor is a human being. Uh, there's been jujitsu people that have been wrapped up in all kinds of terrible stuff that every kind of crime you can imagine. So again, just like a person in the military, just like a SEAL, just like being in the SEAL teams doesn't make you a good person. It applies to everything else. Jiu-jitsu just because you do jiu-jitsu does just because you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu doesn't make you a good person Like here's a good one just because you're a priest mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're a good person there's plenty of Malevolent people out there that wear the cloth of God, but actually practice the work of Satan so You have to apply that rule to everything and it's definitely the same with jiu-jitsu and jiu-jitsu Jiu-jitsu is a power. It's a position of power, right? Mm -hmm. When you're good at it, you have some power over other people, and some people are going to abuse that power. Um, if you have the right mindset, jiu-jitsu is extremely humbling because you realize that what you realize when you do jiu-jitsu is that you can be beat by other people. Mm -hmm. That's what you realize. And, and it, for the most part, as a broad generalization, if another human has been training longer than you, they can beat you. And this is especially in the beginning of jujitsu, right? Mm -hmm. Once you have, once you get further along, it's it, it that that gap closes up. Mm -hmm. But in general, if someone's been training six months and you've been training one, you're going to get beat. There, there's very few exceptions to that. If you've been training for a year and someone's been training for one month, you're going to beat that person that's been training for one month. That's just, and and there, that covers a huge, that covers all kinds of weight classes and, and athletic ability and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. A great athlete, total stud, can, can, if you've been training for one month and you got someone, they're going to someone that's been training for a year, year and a half, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. So if you realize that when you start, that makes you humble. And if you remember that as you get better, it will keep you humble if you don't forget that. Mm -hmm. But what happens is sometimes people forget that it's jujitsu that gives them the power to submit other people, and it's not their power, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's yeah. not their power. They believe that they are the power of jujitsu. They think it's them, and so they think they're better than anyone else, and that what that is, is that's arrogance. That's mm -hmm. what it is, and it's ugly. And I think, really, if I was to drill down, 
I would say it's caused by people that are number one insecure, right? They're insecure, so they just they get this thing that they're that they can dominate other people and they they relish it, mm-hmm. or you know also uh, people that are just like not that smart, <laughs> right? Smart. Yeah, they don't realize they don't they don't put two and two together that like oh the reason I'm better the reason I can choke this person is because I've been training longer than them. Right. That doesn't make me a better human being. Yeah. It just means I'm better at this one aspect of being a human being. So I would say those are yeah, those are those are some of the reasons. And if you end up at a school where people are arrogant, just, just don't train there. Go to yeah. a different school. Yeah. Unless it's like the only school option you have. Yeah. And if it's getting in your way, I mean, cuz there's a difference. Let's face it, like being arrogant is kind of strong, but you know, being not humble in these teeny tiny little ways, you know, you run into that all the time. Just these small ways. It, still within the jiu-jitsu community, though. You know, so, you know, this guy may always talk about how good his triangle choke is or yeah. something like this. You know, this yeah. kind of stuff. And that's not to mention, that's, like... That's not offensive, though. Right? Yeah, exactly. Is it? Exactly. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, I'm not offended by that. Like, but, I probably say, yeah, you do have a good... Uh, yeah. But you know how guys will brag and, you know, be like, oh, it's kicking ass in that tournament or I don't know, something like yeah, that. Yeah. It doesn't scream humble. You know, it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. So maybe like that expectation or whatever. OK, I think y- you kind of got to make a concession for those sorts of things. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, you know, this is something I, I talk about. It's a dichotomy of leadership. It's a dichotomy of the ego. Right. Yeah. Y- you don't want to go to a school where no one cares if they win or loses. You want to go yeah. to a school like where. Hey, when we train here, we're training to beat each other. Like yeah. we're training to, to, to win. Yeah. There's, when you win, there, you're happy. There's yeah. ego on the mat for sure. Yeah. My ego's on the mat. I don't like to lose. I don't like to tap. I don't, you know, it's like great. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I love to tap because that means I'm learning. But you don't, so that's, that's acceptable. Like yeah. that's, of course. Yeah. You want to train a place where there's competitiveness in the school. Yeah. But this is totally different. This is, yeah. you know, when you get people that are just arrogant, arrogant jerks, jerks, and, jerks and they're yes. definitely out there. Yep. But most, I don't know. I don't want to say most. That's the way it should be. They haven't learned jujitsu correctly. Yeah, and that's not what jujitsu is meant to be. I think you're, in my opinion, hundred percent right when you say it's like an insecure person, and not the kind like broken insecure. It's no, just no, no. you know they like some someone who's thing. just a little bit insecure. You know, someone comes in like especially if you're an in, in like a, t- a certain type of instructor, and you're used to like everyone just listening to every word you say, and then I don't know, a student or someone comes with something different than what you said, or the opposite of what you said, or something that kind of indicates that what you said isn't hundred percent correct. It's like boom, you're gonna defend that little position that you've kind of grown accustomed to you know especially if you're even a little bit insecure you can at least have those feelings so and it's interesting how that even that this jujitsu once again reflects leadership in life if you get a guy if you get an instructor that gets shown a move but it's not his move and he gets mad about it yeah like your respect for the instructor goes down it doesn't go up if you get a guy that goes wow that's awesome let me see that again let me learn that let me incorporate that in my game that's a great Mm -hmm. thing thanks for showing me yeah your respect for that teacher goes up yeah. because you recognize that they're humble, that they're evolving, that they want to learn, that they have an open mind, which is what you want to see in your leaders yeah. and in your jiu-jitsu instructors. 100%. Boom. Yeah. So funny. Adam Mazin. Mm-hmm. A Mazin. Coach Adam. Coach Adam. Yeah. So he, I came in one time, he's teaching this move and he, you know, he teaches really good. I was like, yeah, it's a good move, you know, and He's teaching it, and when he explained what this move was, it was a move that he just got beat with in a tournament Mm. that someone else did and obviously was really good. And to me, that really— Do you remember the move? Yeah, yeah, it was like um, it was similar to the— Okay, I remember back in the day, Frank Mir got this guy named Pete, Pete, big tall guy Pete. This is old school UFC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pete, what was his last name? Maniac. Wasn't it the maniac? He twisted his arm, yes. right? It's like yeah. an Americana in an arm lock position. Yeah, over yeah, yeah. hook, you know, from the guard. Yeah. It was kinda like that, but it was a straight arm lock. Yeah. And the guy's name was Philippe. Oh, really? Wasn't it Tim Sylvia? No, it oh in the UFC it was it was um Frank Mir did it to Pete. I think his name is Pete. He was a San Diego guy actually. Oh, okay. He was old school. I thought it was Tim I thought it was Tim Sylvia. No, Tim Sylvia's he broke his arm oh. in a shallow arm bar. Oh, that okay. I, you might be thinking about that, but um, nonetheless, when Adam got hit with it in the tournament, it was against a guy named Philippe um, Gracie Bauge. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so to me, when Adam 
decides to teach that move, that was like the opposite of what this arrogance is. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, oh, and make a bunch of excuses and yeah, dismiss yeah. it because no. I'm dope. You know, and that was just a, you know, once in a lifetime situation. He was like, man, this is a legitimate move. It Something, worked. Yeah, it worked on me, by the way. And that's not to mention getting over the fact that you lost in a tournament and then now you're going to kind of revisit the whole situation by yeah. glorifying the move kind of thing. So that's like the ultimate in humility, in my opinion. There you go. But it makes sense. I mean, not to say it's good or it's like an excuse or it's fine or not, or even acceptable, whatever, but it, it does make sense, though. Even like competitors, you know, like uh, he said practitioners, but maybe competitors or whatever yeah. were, you know, you have the competitive aspect of it. And so you're going to talk a high game about your jujitsu, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of how it is or whatever. To be an arrogant jerk, though, that, uh, yeah, I think that's like something that the human being brought into jujitsu, you know, and then the jujitsu kind of just mixed it, you know, what mixed in. <laughs> that's what I think. That's what I think. That's what it seems like anyway. But I think for the most part, when you start jujitsu, it makes you more humble than you were before, 100% because of that it, reason. It really should. And if it yeah. doesn't, you're wrong. Yeah. Even, man, it's hard, it's hard to imagine how it wouldn't, even like in an exceptional No, it's situation. because when people start to get good at it and then they forget what it was like, yes. that's what oh, happens. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's what happens. And then it comes biting you one day, yeah, you know? Yeah. When f no, you know what? But it's a, you, these guys, and here's the thing. When you've been in the game long enough, you see this super clear too, right? So let's say you get this, I don't know, this, this is a straw man, by the way. So you get this guy, he gets humbled, right? He starts jujitsu, he gets humbled, he gets good at jujitsu, good at moves, he's tapping everybody out. Now he's an arrogant jerk. Now when these other big dogs start coming in, he avoids rolling with them. Yeah, yeah, and sure. He doesn't roll with like the higher belts. He doesn't compete. Nothing like that. He only rolls with the lower belts. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing when people do that. It's so obvious. Yeah. So obvious. Man, I remember in when I started jujitsu, and this was like a few, like a year, two years in. I remember being like kind of apprehensive, not apprehensive, kind of scared actually. In and I was working at the club, where you kind of walk around, and you know, in the nightclub situation, it's you can't oh, help but be like, you don't know if this guy knows jujitsu. Exactly, or not. man, and nervous. worried where it's like, man, I got to just humbling. yes, hundred yeah. percent. And man, if there's not even a little bit of that in your head, it's like, man, something yeah. must be weird. Because you, even me, I walk around like, I, the, hey, I'm pretty good at jujitsu, but there might be somebody out there that's better. Yeah, I and mean, then what are you gonna do? <laughs> so be careful who you run your mouth to. Yeah. How's that? How about you treat people with respect? How's that? Yeah. Sounds like a good idea yeah. to me. And that's the result of being humbled and. Humility in general. Man, it, think about it, though. In the nightclub, like, everyone's kind of sizing each other up, and it's kind of this thing that that's the climate. You know, that's what it feels like. Man, I remember thinking, like, this skinny guy right here, especially a tall skinny guy, yeah. who in, if you didn't know about jiu-jitsu, a tall skinny guy is a non, you know, non-factor kind of yeah. thing. But now it's like, man, if you get caught in an arm bar or a choke in the, on the, you know, on the streets, so to speak, <laughs> right, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. Huge trouble. Stay humble. Stay humble. But yes, that's the explanation. I agree with you 100%. Next question. Next question. Unless you want to talk about Jiu-Jitsu more. Some more cuz. I could if you want. We could. You could. I'd listen. Next question. When you grow in size in an organization, do you have to change the principles of combat leadership from extreme ownership or adopt new ones? No. Oh wait, so I, but I asked this kind of weird in a you weird asked tone. It a like, little bit tone. do I have to, do you have to do any either of the, either of these? Right, that's yeah. kind of the, the yeah. question. Do you have to change the principles or adopt new ones? Do you have to do that? No, the the answer is no. As a matter of fact, when your organization gets bigger, the only change you have to make is to get better at the laws of combat. That's what you have to do. So, as you grow. You have to work harder to build relationships with other divisions so that you can cover and move for each other, right? That's 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 a given. You have to get better at keeping things simple because the message has to be spread to more people, so a word has to be spread that is simple, clear, and concise. That makes sense. You have to learn how to prioritize and execute better because there's a larger group of people that have to shift their focus on whatever priority is coming out. It's a, you have a bigger ship to turn. And you have to do this accurately and quickly, and there's less room for error in shifting priorities when you have a bigger organization. And of course, for decentralized command, you, you have to get better at that because in a small organization, it's, it's pretty easy. 
right? You don't really you don't really have to do de- in decentralized command if you've got five people working for you, you can actually just control them. Mm-hmm. You don't really have to use decentralized command. It's a place to begin it and and instill that culture, but you can get away without it because you can actually you can actually watch everyone. You can direct everyone. You can influence everyone and you can actually lead them directly when you're in a small organization. So you don't have to be all that great at decentralized command. But as you get bigger, you just can't do that anymore. So the only way to watch everyone and direct everyone and influence everyone and lead everyone, the only way to do that is through your subordinate leadership, is through decentralized command. So you have to be better at that. Now, I will say that the the one thing that you maybe have to adjust, it's not really a, a, a principle, but you, you are going to have to look at your communication methods. You're going to have to look at your communication methods. You just aren't going to be able to meet with everyone face-to-face anymore. You, you, you won't have time. When, you, you, your organization, when your organization gets big enough, you won't. There'll be employees there and subordinate leaders that you'll never see. Maybe some, you know, some that you've never been on, on a call with. So how do you get the message? How do you get the mission all the way through the organization? We have to do it with decentralized command, but how do you communicate it? And my thing is always like you have to communicate in every available method. And the bigger you get, the more the larger your organization is, you got to take advantage of everything. You got to take advantage of calls, of emails, of meetings, of of physical documents that you know you put out and say, hey, everyone read this and and you make videos. I'm making that recommendation a lot now to big larger organizations that I work with is why aren't you know I'll ask them how often are you having an all hands type meeting? Well, it's really hard because you can't really get face to face with everyone because we've got multiple different, not only multiple different areas, but we've got multiple different time zones. So if we want, you know, you got someone on the other side of the ocean, hey, we want to have a meeting at a reasonable time. It's impossible to have everyone at a reasonable time. Mm. So what do you do? Okay, eventually it's, okay, well, why don't you make videos? Make it, make it, make a four minute video that everyone can see and understand and see where the vision's going. So, all these, every different communication methods that you can hit all the different types of people. Because there's some people that like to read emails. There's some people that won't watch a video, but they'll they'll read an email. They'll read a document. There's some people that will not sit in a conference call, but they'll go through the notes that get sent out, abridged notes. It's, so there's all kinds of ways to communicate. And my advice is to use them all. But the fundamental principles of leadership itself don't change. So don't just stick to them. Actually get better and pay more attention to them. Mm-hmm. Check. Decentralized command. That seems like the one. But actually, now, what, now that you kind of explain it, they all seem pretty important. Well, they are all important. And there's and they are... It's interesting. They're They're actually in order. What? They're like actually in order. It. Well, they're in order. The way we wrote them in the, the book, okay, the way gotcha. I originally talked about them, yeah, it was yeah. like number one covered move. If you're not doing that, it's teamwork. If you're not doing that, you, you're, you're not going to do anything. Mm. Number two is you got to keep things simple. Like you have to do that because you can't cover move for someone else if you don't even understand what's going yeah, on. Right? So yeah, it's got to yeah. be simple. Mm-hmm. And then prioritize and execute. Well, there's going to be things that are changed and things that are dynamic. And so the next thing you got to worry about is like when things change, how are you going to prioritize what's changing? How are you going to handle these problems? Mm-hmm. But then the the last one is is decentralized command, which is now that you've got those other four kind of stable, now you can start really leading properly. Gotcha. But well, yeah. but for your, to your credit, if you flip those upside down, in order of sort of broad organizational importance, decentralized command is the most important one. Now you're not gonna have it without the other three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prioritize and execute is the next important one from an organizational perspective. Keeping things simple is then the next one. And so if you flip them upside down as an organization, the level of importance inside the organization is is reversed, but the way that you have to implement them gotcha, yeah. and the and you the bottom line is you'll never get to decentralized command if you can't keep things simple. Yeah. You don't come so yeah. you can't get there. But in order to build them so in order to build them you have to kind of use them in order. But then when you look at them when you look at them from the importance of how well they make a team function. Right, yeah. Again, if you can't cover and move at all or you can't keep things simple, you'll never get to decentralized command. But when you have someone that's working them all and they're all doing well, well, then the most important one is decentralized command. Decentralized command is the one that takes you to the highest level, mm-hmm. right? It'll have the most impact on your organization. You'll never get there without the other three. Mm-hmm. But once you have those three and you, you implement decentralized command, you'll be absolutely, that'll be the most powerful thing in your organization. You can't do it without the other three. It's the strongest, but it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't matter without the other three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
check. Next question. Jocko, how does your quote unquote play the game play the games in terms of completing the goal fit in with Jordan Peterson's agreeableness in terms of career advancement? Is it a case of right time, right agreeableness? So this comes from Jordan Peterson talking about how people that are more agreeable have less success in promotion and salary than someone that is more assertive. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question because this person is taking what I talk about, which is play the game, right? And, and thinking that that means agreeableness. And it does to some extent. Yeah, it yeah. absolutely does to some extent. And so, so that's a, this is a really good question. And the answer is that there's a dichotomy to this, that they're like, like all of life and like all of business and like all of leadership, there's a dichotomy because while, while someone that is agreeable, like, like very agreeable, certainly has less of a chance of career advancement than someone that is assertive Right? That, that makes sense like if you never say hey, I'll do that or hey, let me let me handle that project if you don't ever do that mm -hmm. and someone says hey No, I'll do this and you go. Okay, that's fine. And you we're gonna promote this guy. Oh, okay, that's fine yeah. You know if you're that agreeable. Well, yeah, it's gonna be problematic But also when in when assertiveness turns into overly aggressive The chances of advancement start to go back down again and when you take someone that's when you get to someone that is ultra aggressive and rubs people the wrong way and won't do any compromising, that person's going to be at the same person, same level of advancement as someone that's super agreeable, or at least in the same ballpark. They'll be close if they still have a job at all, by the way, because someone that's you know overly aggressive and won't compromise with anyone and calls everyone out, the if they're the complete far end of the spectrum, opposite to agreeableness, that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So. So when I talk about playing the game, I'm I'm definitely talking about being agreeable because I'm telling you to be more agreeable, right? When you don't play the game, it's like, hey, we're we're gonna think this, we're gonna run this new project. That's project is stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, an agreeable person would say, okay, well, that sounds good. Where are we going with this? Now, an agreeable person that's too agreeable might go down the road of something that's not a good plan. But if you're overly aggressive, if you're not playing the great game at all, you're not gonna get past go. <laughs> Right, so when I say play the game, yeah, I am talking about being a girl. Now I was talking to someone the other day who's pretty hardcore, and he was feeling some heat from his boss in a company that I was working with, and he wanted to fight back. Mm -hmm. Wanted to fight back. Hashtag resist. Right? <laughs> and he wanted to sure. fight back. He wanted to go beyond that. He wanted to go beyond resist. He wanted to go like into the aggressive mode. Mm. And I told him, "Don't fight back." I said, "Play the game." And he sort of got aggressive because, like I said, he's a pretty hardcore guy. He, he started getting aggressive with me and started saying, like, oh, that's what I should do now, bow down and kiss the ring. I'm not going to do that. I'm a man, right? <laughs> he came at me with that, with that angle. Sure. And then he said this, which was interesting. He goes, you know, he said something along the lines of, like, you wouldn't take this kind of crap. Why should I? And I stayed quiet for a minute. And I heard him say that. And I was like, oh, you just served me a bull softball. <laughs> And then, you know, I took a big breath and I'm like, you have no idea. You have no idea the things that I have done, the pride that I have swallowed, the dumb jokes I've laughed at, the idiotic plans I've supported, the insane lengths that I had to go through throughout my career, my entire career, to win. To win in the end, that was my goal. And in order to win, you gotta play the game. You gotta massage some egos. You have to accept some things that you normally might not accept. You have to eat some humble pie some from time to time. And what you're doing and why you do those things is so that you can build so that you can build confidence with your boss. That's what you're doing. So you can build trust with your boss. And you do that. So that in the end, if your boss is not a good guy, you can actually beat the boss. You can win. But you can't win if you don't play the game. You'll lose before you even start. So play the game. That's what I told this guy, right? Now, do, can you, do you have to balance this? Yes, you absolutely do. Because if you become a sycophant and you just become a brown noser, am I talking about becoming a brown noser? No. Because if you do that, you're losing clout and influence with your with your team or with your subordinates or with your peers because you're brown nosing the boss and you're losing clout there. 
So you have to, you, and you won't win because those guys are going to get pissed at you. And they're not going to support you. So I'm not saying you go overboard. You have to have balance. You have to know when to say yes, when to appease. When, you know, I built so much clout. I built clout by doing things that people wanted me to do that like maybe I was kind of a weird project or they want me to try some piece of equipment out. It's like, cool, yeah, I'll try it. We'll write you a good report about it. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, you want me to try some new tactic? Cool, we'll give it a try. I, I In my mind, I'm thinking this is dumb. But you know what? Hey, let's give it a try. Oh, you know what? We It didn't work as well as I was hoping it would, but you know, here's some points we took away from it. Okay, the guy at least, as opposed to saying that new tactic is stupid. Mm-hmm. Your plan is dumb. Okay, I'm disagreeable. What's that going to get me? It's not going to get. It, I'm being too assertive. I'm being too aggressive. So you have to you have to balance it. You have to know when to tactfully stand up and disagree with someone, instead of being totally agreeable all the time. And I'm not talking about being agreeable all the time. I'm talking about balance. That's what I'm talking about. And that's playing the game. Yeah. So playing the game is not f- being a a submissive, agreeable baby right that's not that's <laughs> not that's up. not playing the game yeah playing the game is playing balance is knowing when is building trust it's it's doing some dumb things showing respect it's mm. just playing the game yeah. and you're playing the game to win that's what you're playing the game for yeah yeah you uh, yeah and and i i get it you know like playing the game you know maybe got viewed as like being agreeable but when Jordan Peterson talks about agreeableness, he's talking about a personality trait. He's not True. talking about like some action you took to do something, you know? Well, yeah, but agreeableness has r- resulting actions. If you're an agreeable person, you're yeah, going to yeah. be... Fully, but when it comes, when it stems from a personality trait, that means just like how you said, like you're going to be agreeable for the most part regardless. Like I, I forget what the 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 other trait was is called about, you know, success when he was talking mm-hmm. about that. But... um. Nonetheless, like if you're talking, you're talking about playing the game, meaning sure, you might have to display some agreeableness every once yeah, in a yeah. while to kind of size it when you have to or when you, you know, when it's useful. That does not mean you're an agreeable person as a personality trait. It's yeah, true. way too, yeah, two no. different, completely different I, things. I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not saying that you're going to be able to train your, change your personality. Yeah. Because I'm not a very agreeable person. I agree with people all day long. Right. Why? Because I'm that's trying the, to win. That's the point. Exactly right. I actually disagree with 89% of the things that I hear on a daily basis. <laughs> Dang, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm literally yeah. trying to figure out right now as I'm thinking about this, so many things I disagree with. Yeah. There's two things that are going on. Number one, th- this is this is straight up. Number one, if you give me an idea mm. and I go, that's dumb, Echo. Mm-hmm. Number one, I'm arrogant. I'm not listening. I'm I'm shutting the idea out when your idea might have some good traits to it. Mm-hmm. Number two, you're pissed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't gather any clout with you. We, I didn't build our relationship at all. Yeah. I just said like, hey, that's a dumb idea. No. So instead, I'm be like, okay, well, tell me about it. Yeah. Tell me about like how would you, how would you implement this idea of yours? Because maybe it could have some good benefit. I could see where you're coming from on this. Yeah. Well, now I'm I'm building our relationship, yeah. and you're thinking that hey, this guy listens to me, and that's what I like, and someone I work with, someone that listens to me. So right. those are the kind of things that we're talking about. I'm not yes. talking about changing your personality. I'm right. a disagreeable I'm a disagreeable human being, but I don't show that very often. Right. I don't There's something I was talking about I was talking about this. Who was I talking to? I forget who I was talking to, but I was talking about how I never ever like there's some things that really bother me sure. in the world and I never tell anyone what they are. I will not. I'll go to the gr- maybe I'll put like in my last will and testament things that bothered me. <laughs> but I will but but I, but I don't tell anyone. Yeah. Why? Why? Well, the main reason is cuz when you're in the teams and people know what bothers yeah, yeah, you, yeah. they're going to get it. <laughs> they're going to tear you up with that thing. Yeah. So you will never I'll never say it. Won't yeah. tell my kids, won't tell my wife nothing. When something happens that really really bothers me, mm-hmm. cuz I'm disagreeable. I don't like that kind of stuff. Is it like pet peeve kind of stuff? Both. Or is <laughs> all the above. <laughs> all right. Personality cool. traits I don't like. The yeah. way people communicate sometimes I don't like. Mm-hmm. Little pet peeves that I have of things that people do that I don't like. I don't no one knows any of them. Dang. No one knows any. They're all deep undercover. Dang. And I will never tell anyone what they are. You wanna I feel like you should kind of tell me just so I avoid these things because I'm very agreeable in that way. Yeah. Where I don't want to do that stuff. Like if I'm saying, you know, people say I don't know. Know what I'm saying? Know what I'm saying? Or like? If I say like, I say like a lot. Do you not like that? Is that one of the things? You'll I'll never, never tell, tell anyone. Me. I'll never tell anyone. All right. What well, these things are. All right. Cool. You're, 
you're the target list for you. It's not that big. I'm I'm at low risk. <laughs> All right, I'm still on the radar though. All right, yeah. hey man, you know I so do yeah. It. Hey everyone, play the game. Play the game. I know it's everyone wants. It. That's the funny thing is everyone thinks like Jock was hardcore. No, yeah. I'll take no crap from nobody. And it's like, right. no, actually, I'm gonna play the game because you know why? I'm gonna win. That's the yeah. difference. I'm gonna win. Yeah, that was kind of part of your story too. Like when 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 the guy was was that a face to face thing when you're talking you're talking about the guy yes, who said it was. So there was like a built in assumption right there when he assumption. said you wouldn't take that. You crap. wouldn't I was take like, that. Would you? Wait, wait. I was like, oh, actually, let me tell you what my life has been like. Yeah. And you and of course they're looking at me now and they're thinking, well, he just he just. Uh, Aggressively crushed everyone on his rise to the top, right? Yeah. It's like no, not true at all. Yeah, maneuvered. Yeah, like played the game. Yeah, yeah. nothing wrong with playing the game. Yeah. Now, I, again, this isn't. We're not talking about like you just become a kiss ass. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, being a kiss ass is equally bad. Yeah. It's equally saying, bad. Yeah. You yeah. lose just as much respect, yeah. not only from your peers, not only from your subordinates, but also from the, the person that you're working with. Yeah, They even know you're a kiss ass, and yeah. they'll run roughshod all over you. And when it comes time to promotion, they'll be like, you know what? I'm going to promote the other guy because it doesn't really matter. This guy is going to gonna kiss my ass regardless. Yeah. Because you're too, you're too agreeable. Yeah. So I'm not talking about this. This is a dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, man. So you... Again, the point that, <laughs> that I was making, that I think there might have been a misunderstanding given the question. Like, play the game isn't the same as this agreeableness that Jordan Peterson is talking about. It's different. They're not the same thing. Well, he, he, no, they're he, not yeah, the same thing. Yeah, it seems th- like the well, question that he thought he, it was the same thing. Yeah, he exactly. He thinks that playing the game is being agreeable. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It might sometimes right. be acting agreeable. Yeah. It might be agreeing to some things that make you a little bit frustrated, yeah. but you roll with it. Because you know what? You're playing to win. You're playing the long game. This is a joke, this conversation we're having with my with my boss or with my subordinate. Yeah. Like, it's a joke. That thing doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I don't care if I win this argument. Right. I'm playing yeah. the long game over here. Like, uh, playing to win. You ever watch Survivor? No. Come on, bro. You ever watch Survivor? Uh, no, I mean, I've seen shows <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, Okay. So, I don't watch Survivor. Yet. Well, I do. I mean, my wife does, so. Hence is it still from, on? I didn't even know it's still a show. I, I think it's still on, yeah. Okay. So, Survivor, playing the game. And that, that's a term that is all up, all up in Survivor, oh, okay. playing the game. So, okay, when Survivor, I'm going to take too long on Survivor, but it's it's totally in line with what you're talking about. So, Survivor, you you know, they throw, and here's what the basis, just the prime raw basis of Survivor, you throw a bunch of people on. I know, everyone knows the basis. Thing. Yeah. yeah. The, you do some challenges. Vote each other off. You vote each other off with certain, um, you know, uh, advantages you can win and what not, right? Little rewards, whatever you mean. So, and how it turned itself, like, what it morphed kind of into, just by nature, is like this little political game within the For game, sure. right? And now it's just a huge overt part of Survivor, the political game. I'm playing the game. Yeah. I'm building alliances. I'm doing all this stuff or whatever. It's the exact same thing, man. Exact same thing. Yeah. I'm building relationships or whatever. L- and- yeah. Let me tell you what the huge difference is. And this is a huge difference. In that game, you're playing the game to win for yourself. Yeah. And what I'm talking about, and I, this is a this is a such a huge part of the way I think that I didn't even talk about it because it's just embedded in the way I think. If you're playing the game to further yourself and further your own career, you're it, it's not going to work for you. Yeah. Because when you play the game like that, it's the same thing as like kissing ass. It's the same thing as you're you're doing things because you want the advantage and people will identify that. If you're making if you're playing the game so that your team can win, so that you can accomplish the mission, that's when this works. That's when playing the game works. Otherwise, if you're doing it to promote yourself, yeah. you, it's not going to work. And it might work once or twice and it might get you one promotion, but everyone that saw you get promoted after you kissed ass, they're all pissed at you. Yeah. They're going to undermine you and you're going to go down. Bro, you know what's so it's so interesting about what you just said there is that you're absolutely right. Survivor is like the one guy, right? So playing the game, I'm playing the game, right? Anytime someone says that, like, hey, I'm playing the game, they do it in this context where it's like, so, and that's okay, we're here, it's a game, so it's acceptable, I'm playing the game. But they'll always say it in ex- as an excuse for, for like actions. lying to someone sure. or backstabbing someone. And it's so weird how that, you're exactly right, that's the nature of the game. So when you play the game in in this context, you know, in, at work or the way you're talking about, it's always a good thing. It's all, because no, it's you're looking no, out as for As long as you're doing it for, for the, the team. team. Yes, exactly yeah. right. That, so it's not always a good thing because there's people that play the game and they play the game so that they are going to 
you know, I I just said this ten times. I was like, I play to win, but yeah, I play for my team to win. I play right. for us to be able to accomplish the mission. Yeah, that's why I'm playing the game. Yeah, if you're playing the game so that you can get the promotion, or that's not gonna. And like I said, it might work once or twice, but it's not gonna be. It's not a long term solution. Yeah, yeah. I guarantee that, it's not a long term solution. Yeah, and that's, that's a strong I mean. statement. I guarantee it's not a long term solution. Yeah. Now. What if you now? Here's an example. Just taking well, this one step further. You could play the game to get that one promotion, and then you could go. Okay, now I can play the game to help the team. Right. But yeah. you had to do some maneuvering to get into a spot where you could yeah. help. Yeah. That's a tricky one because yes. people still think you're a, a jerk. Right. Because of what you did. Yeah. But then you get there, and it's going to take you a long time to build that trust back up because you maneuvered and you got collateral damage around there. Yeah. It's not a good thing. It's not hard to clean up that collateral damage. Yeah, man. So you can't always do it, actually. Yeah, Be so careful. You, you know how you say you'll lose a battle to win the war kind of thing? For sure. So now in your little example there right there, you're like you you lost a battle to win a little mini war to essentially lose a bigger battle to win a, even a bigger war. <laughs> These are you things that saying? could happen. Like all this little, it's just uh, like in jiu-jitsu, you sacrifice a position because okay. you know you're going to end up with a area of the game that you're really good at, Yeah. right? I mean, what, yeah. think about pulling guard. What's pulling guard? Yeah, that's exactly you're, what you're, that you're is. You're sacrificing being on the bottom because you're good at it. Yeah. For a bigger, so yeah, for, for, a, for a bigger victory. Yeah. Uh, God, this game goes deep, man. This stuff goes deep, indeed. Playing the game. All right. Next question. Hey, Jocko. I'll be heading to Marines OCS soon, and I know how crucial leadership is for success at OCS, TBS, and as a Marine. My question is, what happens if you make a decision as a leader that you can rationalize at the best as the best decision for the team, but the result is not a good one. Will my superiors want to see that I'm making quality decisions or producing the best results? I know good decisions usually lead to good results, but when it doesn't, what's the next best way to handle that situation when under evaluation at OCS? Well, like you said, if you make good decisions, generally the outcome's going to be good. But, but you, but it is a correct statement that sometimes you make good decisions and they have bad outcomes. In in combat, that can definitely happen if you decide to go left instead of right. If you if you look to the left and you look to the right and the left has better cover than the right, and so you go to the left, and then the the enemy happen to be happen to have mortars dialed in in that area, and so as soon as you go to the left, even though there's better cover, you get overhead fire, indirect fire, mm-hmm. and people get blown up and people get killed. That may have been a good decision, but the result was bad, and there's no way you could have known that. So what do you do in those situations? You made the best decision that you could with the information that you had at the time, and it turned out to be a bad result. As a matter of fact, in Ramadi, when when they had a, uh, a phrase to describe if someone took a shot at what they presumed was a bad guy, but it turned out to be, let's say, a civilian, mm-hmm. They would say, and they would investigate heavily to find out what happened. And depending on the situation and what happened most of the time, they would call good shot, bad result. Mm. Meaning a soldier, Marine, uh, someone was looking down a street and they see something and they see something suspicious. And then they see an actual individual out there carrying out enemy tactics, techniques, or procedures. Mm -hmm. And they judge the situation to the best of their ability and and all of a sudden pressure arises and he sees something else that also is enemy activity or enemy procedures and then sees a friendly force approaching and it's like okay these guys are in danger i got to do something takes a shot and it turns out that what the person was doing once they investigate you know someone goes and you know sees what the person was doing they were doing something that was not nefarious mm. it just didn't happen a lot but it definitely it definitely happened mm. and so the the term that they would use would be good shot, bad result. Yeah. And as long as the as long as there was logic to the decision that was being made, and the people that the person that took the shot owned it and said, "Here's what I saw. This is the shot that I took. I that's what happened. I own it." Mm-hmm. And you know, the upper chain of command would then say, "Okay, well, number one, is there anything we can learn from this?" Is there anything that we could learn to, to prevent this from happening again? And if we can't, then we spread that word and tell everyone what happened and why it happened and if there's any way to improve the decision-making process. Mm-hmm. 
Now the biggest mistake that so, so that's what you do you own it You see what you can learn from it and you move on and your in- leadership and or your instructors are gonna see the same thing They're gonna see that you had a logic if you can explain why you made a decision now your explanation might be bad You know you might your explanation might be bad. You might have prioritized wrong mm-hmm. you might have read the terrain wrong you might have assumed that the enemy was gonna do something and they did something else mm-hmm. those are bad bad things that led to your decision those are bad choices those are bad assessments those are uh, mistakes that you made and so those what led to your your logic may be fault faulted would that be a um, like a, a, a ding against you in a in a good yes shot? it would so it wouldn't be a good shot yeah right? because if you said well I thought that the guy was um, I thought there was a curfew yeah. In the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there was no curfew. Why did you not know that? Right. You know what I mean? Like, so not a good so, shot. So you, that's that an case. excuse. Yeah. Right? That's not a good shot. You okay. you took a shot that your logic doesn't right, right. match Didn't up. Get you there. Yeah. Um but the other big mistake or I'd say the biggest mistake, of course, that people make when they make a bad decision is or things that don't make sense is that they defend them. Or they blame other people, they blame other circumstances, and that's what they say. Well, I, no one told me. Yeah, yeah. No one told me that that or no, you know, the, the sergeant was pointing in that direction So that's where I told everyone to go like no don't do that. Don't Don't make excuses, right? Don't make excuses It's like saying well, I did a perfect job, but the but the enemy used mortars and that's out of my control yeah, It's like yeah, no yeah. instead of saying so like the first case like if you if you went left instead of right and you ended up getting mortared And you know you're saying well the I didn't expect the enemy to use mortars that's yeah. that's not my fault. Mm. Instead, you should say, you know what? I, I should have done a better job assessing the mortar threat, and I should have had more space between my troops because that's another thing that I screwed up. Is my troops were too close together, and so we had multiple get wounded with one mortar round. That shouldn't have happened. And we could have moved quicker through that area, which I failed to do. So those are the mm. things I'm going to fix next time. And there you have it. Mm. There you have it. Don't make excuses. If you own it and you explain what you can do better, the instructor is going to agree and they're going to move on. And if you make excuses, the instructors are going to eat you alive. <laughs> and by the way, if you make bad decisions continually and you keep owning them, well, let's say you keep making bad decisions. And so you start thinking to yourself, well, I can't take ownership of this anymore. I'm going to get kicked out of here. Well, guess what? So then you start making excuses for them. You're really going to get kicked out of there. Then. <laughs> You're really going to get kicked out of there. <laughs> so that's something to keep in mind. Also keep in mind that the instructors know everything that's happening they can see so much more than you can yeah. and I know this because I was an instructor for a lot I was you know, running the training for a long time you can see so much one a classic example when you go through officer candidate school you're not allowed to look at your food yeah and when I first so they say don't look at your food so I sat down the first meal mm-hmm. and I'm like well no one's gonna know if I'm looking at my food how can they tell <laughs> and so I just glanced down <laughs> at my food <coughs> instantly there's drill instructors all over you yelling at you and like, yeah. who told you not to look at your food you're mm-hmm. weak and all that stuff mm-hmm. and I'm thinking how the hell did they know <laughs> 13 weeks later or 12 weeks weeks later at, at officer candidate school you're you're uh, a Candidate officer which means you're now kind of in between the yeah. recruits and the drill instructors mm-hmm. And so you're allowed to walk around and you're reinforcing and you go to the one of the tables where there's 30 Recruits sitting there or officer candidates sitting there mm-hmm. and you look down the line and when someone glances at their at their food for a millisecond it's completely <laughs> obvious it's so completely obvious you can't hide it yeah. Even, I'm talking just their eyes are moving yeah. but it's so obvious yeah. and that's what it's like with everything when you're going through tactical training the instructors can really see a lot they can't see it that much because it's a, a little less control but yeah. they can see a lot and also they have things planned and part of the plan is that you're gonna fail sometimes they're gonna set it up that way and they want to see how you react to that they want to see how you handle the stress uh, number one of an unwinnable situation mm. and then when you fail how do you re- react to failure itself do you just blame everybody else do you not it wasn't my fault because that's what you're doing it's gonna mm. be problematic and huh. the last thing I would say to this guy here um, dude r- relax a little bit yeah. right because you haven't even gone to OCS yet and yet you're fearing judgment Mm. You're fearing not being considered to be perfect and you're not gonna be perfect and you're going to be absolutely judged It's okay. Be humble do your best and have a great time. It's awesome military training so fun (laughs) Interesting I've heard mixed uh, opinions about that, but hey, I get it. I'll tell you you know why you know why it's easy to see you looking at your food Why tell you why it's an anatomical thing when you look down your eyelids and eyelashes all that stuff goes boom 
they just sh- they shift down and it's super obvious physically to see yeah yeah notice that if you look side to side not much only your little eyeball uh-huh. or whatever but if you look down but you can't look down without doing your eyelids you see what i'm saying like you gotta i kinda, guess so like when you look down you, your eyelids just and your eyelashes all stuff, i know is this go. it's real obvious yeah Real obvious. That's funny though. Yeah. Because I I thought I, the same I thing. Totally thinking, thought oh, I was gonna get just do it. Just oh for a no, you can't. And no. it's not like you can act like you're looking at something else and they you can't do that because no. you know you got to look how. straight ahead. Yeah. It was actually f- so funny how, how I got so busted and how <laughs> cocky I was thinking how how are they gonna stop me from looking at my food? I'll just yeah. glance down. Yeah. And they just are on you, you like, and like white on rice the other guys by the way. Yeah. And and you look down and they jump on you. It's crazy. It's good funny. stuff. I feel like the this this kind of thing may be a good way to look at it, and I'm only going on based on kind of what you said. But like any any decision, like situation where you got to okay, I got to make the right call or the right you know, um, you know tactics or what you know to get a certain result or whatever. It to, it really when you kind of think about it more. What I do anyway, it there's always an element of chance, right? Yeah. Remember how like okay, so I'm going to the post office, right? I'm driving. The, there is like. Okay, so me saying, okay, I'm going to go to the, go the safest route to the post office. I'm going to get there, but boom, I'm going to deliver or mail my thing. I'm going to come home. The chance that I get killed in one way or another, car accident, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, is there. Very small, but it's still there. So, and not to say, you know, not to say the, the how big or small of a chance these things are. I'm just saying there is an element of chance, regardless of how big, how small, okay. of <clears throat> something getting in the way of your success even if you make all the right decisions oh, yeah, yeah. or if you make the wrong decisions there's For chance sure. just involved in general here you just made me think of something that can that can jam people up as you like to say sure and this is a something that guys used to say to me and so you need to try and avoid this people would say I was trying to make I was trying to do what what I thought you would want me to do. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I thought that's what you would want to see. That's what they'd say. Gotcha. Well, I thought that's what you'd want me to do. I thought, I thought that's what you want to see. Yeah. So if you start playing that game, mm-hmm. like, you start assessing what's going on, and then you start adding a layer of, like, what do the instructors want me to do right here? Yeah. The chances are that that's not going to turn out well. Yeah. Because you're trying to predict what, what you should do is look at what's happening and make the best decision possible yeah. from your, from your, um, perspective mm. it, the minute you start thinking well they you know they just taught a class on on breaking contact they mm. probably want me to break contact right here yeah, so you call yeah. a break contact and yeah. then everyone runs away and mm. then they go why did you break contact so it was one guy with a rifle and you had a 40-man platoon mm. what's wrong with you and mm. they go and then and then what you say is well I thought you wanted us to no we want you to run a good tactical situation <laughs> yeah yeah don't do sense. what people what you think what people want you to do don't yeah. do that generally yeah. I'm not saying don't weigh it at all yeah. because they're teaching you something. Yeah. But don't be stupid. Yeah, don't be <laughs> stupid. That's good advice. But yeah, but see, see what I'm saying though? That that chance is always there. Yeah, so, there's always a chance you're going to... And it's weird how like when... When you when you're successful in something, I don't know, whatever, even even like in like life, like if you're, you're I don't know, your career or something, when you're successful in it, you don't really talk about the chance element, you know? But if you're unsuccessful, that's when you'll be like, oh, just, hey, it's just bad luck. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. hey, these chance kind of situations or whatever. So it seems like, you know, given what you said, that his kind of objective or his kind of outlook or his way of being when he goes into the situation is, hey, man, sure, there's there's going to be these chance. That there's going to be a chance that the result isn't going to be that good. There's a chance, and there's a chance that it's gonna be good or whatever. But focus on the decision, sound decision, decision making, and then if hey, if the chance comes, or the ch- luck, or the probability, the improbable situation, or whatever, that kind of negates your good decision making with its bad result, then hey man, still focus on your decision making. Don't be like oh it was luck, it was someone else's thing that I had no control over, kind of thing. That's what she's saying. It's true. Next question. Next question. Jocko in jujitsu. I telegraph my moves when I focus on whatever escape or submission I'm attempting. And it's pretty obvious to who I'm training with. How do I learn to work on a particular move while actually setting up another move at the same time? The essence of the jujitsu. The essence of jujitsu. Dave Burke question, by the way. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so good question. It, it actually reveals something pretty cool about jujitsu. In many cases, in jujitsu, 
especially in like the first three to five years of training, and that that's a pretty big span. But mm-hmm. what's interesting about is is that the setups for moves are actually other moves, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and you actually have to attempt the other move legitimately in order for it to work as a setup. So if you're mounted on someone and you want to arm lock somebody, don't grab their arm. That's the telegraph. Mm -hmm. What you do is you go for the choke. And you don't just fake go for the choke, you go for the choke. You put those, you dig in, you grab some gi, you start to attack their neck. And, And obviously if they don't defend, then you choke them, which is awesome. But you, so you go for the choke for real. But if they lift up their arm to defend their neck, which they should do, then boom, the arm lock is exposed and you take it. That's the way it works. Mm-hmm. And the same thing goes with Kimura's, and like, like the Kimura sweep guillotine. You know that combo from the guard? It's really like a yes. basic one that you learned the from the beginning. Bump sweep yeah, one. the bump yeah. sweep, the Kimura, and the guillotine from the guard. The, the defense for each one of those is the setup for the other. And, and there's so many, you know, jujitsu, yeah. like that's what jujitsu is, right? I mean, it's like triangle arm lock. It's, it's just, that's the way it is. Yeah. You have to commit to the moves. You can't just like, if you do a half-hearted attempt to do a sit-up sweep on me, I'm not gonna give you the reaction that you need to get a guillotine on me, right? Because mm-hmm. if you don't push me back hard enough, I'm not gonna lean forward enough, I'm not right. gonna be able to grab my neck. Yeah. So it's not gonna work. Now, as you progress in jiu-jitsu, you, you're able to start attacking other things. Like, for instance, you can attack someone's balance as a setup. You can attack their base. You can attack their posture as a setup. You can attack their arm position. So you can attack, the better you get at jiu-jitsu, you can attack some conceptual things. Yeah. Dean said something like that the other day. I was like, dang, that's smart. That's what he was saying was, he's like, hey, the, he said, the person on the bottom can't fall down. <laughs> Dean said that? Yeah. That sounds like Think something about it. Dean would say. I know. It's one of those so things like, that's obvious, but it's profound. Like, yeah. Right? The person on the bottom can't fall down. Yeah. You can't you can't mess with my balance right. at all. Yeah. But I can mess with you. If you're on top, I can mess with your balance. Yeah. That's one of the key things that I try and mess with. Mm-hmm. Your balance. You can't mess with my balance, I'm on the ground. Yeah. Think about that one. Actually you he, you did say that that Dean said that, but um I I, I don't know if he said that um you can't knock me down when I'm on the ground. <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah. Well, that may be it's just good. the way I put it, but that's yeah. the truth. Um, let's see. These principles, obviously, they apply not only to jujitsu, but they apply to the battlefield and they apply to business. Because if you fake a frontal assault to expose the enemy's flank, mm-hmm. but you don't put enough firepower in the frontal assault, then the enemy doesn't have to react to it. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of keep their perimeter secure, and then when you flank them, their their flank is defended. Yeah. So it's the same exact thing. Yeah. You have to commit enough to throw the person's to to make the person react. Yeah. If you don't give them enough, they're not going to react. In the business world, if you come up with a if you put up a new product to contend with your competitor in some market. But the product isn't strong enough that it becomes any kind of threat. Well, then the competitor doesn't have to contend with it at all, and you've actually wasted effort. So if you're going to go, 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 get the reaction that you need. If you're going to execute a move to set up your opponent, it has to be strong enough to elicit a real, real reaction. That's what you have to do. Mm. Yeah. Now you could do something that's like a little distraction. Yeah. That's a little different than a setup, yeah. right? You can distract someone. Mm-hmm. Usually, the distraction is much more minor than a real setup. Yeah, I can get you thinking about something else while I go over here. Yeah, not as effective. Yeah, but it has its times. Yeah, yeah. The that's, that's so interesting. I think Dave Burke mentioned that idea to me before. Wait, is this a question from Dave? That's Burke, from straight Dave up? Burke. Straight up. Yeah. So. Uh, and here's another thing. Dave Burke's kind of early in in the in the game, mm. to, and which is a good thing because he's thinking about this stuff already. Yeah. But I think generally speaking, like these those types of tactics, like where I'm going to go for this, and then when he reacts to that thing I went for, then I'm going to really do my real move kind of thing. And th- and there can be chains too, by the way. It can do oh, one yeah. thing. Yeah, because that's the, next the advanced thing, jiu-jitsu. And the yeah. next thing, yes. And the more you advance two people get when they're rolling against each other, the more that you'll see. So... But being early on? Or the more of it you won't see. I remember 
when Dean and I were training like maniacs, Burke and the dudes. <laughs> sure. And people would watch us and it barely even yeah. looked like jujitsu yeah. because okay. the movements were so subtle. Right. Like you, you, sometimes yeah. you wouldn't even, like I would just feel his weight shift and I would immediately yeah. weight shift my weight. And so there's three or four offensive and defensive moves that happen and there's barely any movement that's visual mm. because it's all in the weight. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So when you mean when you don't see, it's like it's just so subtle that you don't yeah, see you it. You can't from the visually yeah. see it, but it's yeah, to, but totally still there, of course. Um, so that's that's kind of good that he, I think anyway, that he's thinking that you know how to do that. Yeah, but yeah. I think what's more important, given the stage, and this is real generally speaking, because people are different, but. Um, learn the, the the moves, you know, the crisp like move, how, like how to do an arm lock where your hips should be and shouldn't be and what makes an a, a arm lock a good arm lock and what makes an arm lock, for example, a bad arm lock, you know, where it's like, you know how you, some guys can do an arm lock, but it's like super easy to escape because yeah, you have these three details sure. that you just didn't do, even though you know what an arm lock is kind of thing. So I think I think anyway that when when you start to get those things down, you're like I can, brown belt, Noah. Yeah, Ollie. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. He he's got a good arm lock. Yeah, you gotta you gotta watch out for that thing. But yeah. he's an example of like his arm lock is really good, and yeah. everyone's got their really good moves. Yeah, 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 that's fully. a good example. And when when you, when you get you know a handful of those down, or you're just your general game down in in that particular way, then you can start like leaking into that kind of way of thinking where it's like, okay, I'm gonna go for this arm lock, you know, and then I whatever. I'm not sure I hundred percent disagree with you. Because in my mind, if you don't set things up, they're not going to work. Yeah. So you have to set them up, and you have to start learning where that setup looks like. Yeah, but as a, I mean, Dave Burke is at that position right now. The sh- the moves are not working because he's not setting them up because he's telegraphing them. Yeah. So he ha- that's why he's asking the question. Yeah. So when you I, this is the this is the answer to when that question comes, which it will when you start training jujitsu and you start training against people that know what you know or at least some of what you know yeah, they're going to defend yeah and it's proper that they defend because their defense is a setup for your next move yeah that's the part you got to realize yeah so considered um and when he asked me this before or when he talked about it, i forget exactly when it was i i was considering it through his point of view right or and and with an experience okay so both his point of view and my point of view. So if I'm rolling with a, a white belt and mm-hmm. like a real new white belt and he's doing the move that they learned that day. So he's doing it step yep. by step by the way he learned. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is, that's the ultimate in telegraphing, by the way, when mm-hmm. you're looking at the steps that you just watched them learn kind of thing. Yep. You might even have taught it to him. I don't know. So when they do that, it's, I think that's appropriate as far as the learning process. Early on, it's like, yeah, get those down. Yeah. Practice that part of it. Yeah, it's not going to work. It, In fact, it might work on another super new, new guy. Yeah, and and yeah, I know I've rolled with guys. Dean is one of them um, where he, he, you know what he's going to do. Yeah. You know what he's going to do. He might as well tell you yeah. what he's going to do. Uh, and, and he's going to do it. Yeah. Now sometimes you give up, like you give up an inch, and all of a sudden you feel it, and you go, "Oh man, I'm gonna, I, my arm is exposed." Yeah. And you and you spend the next two minutes defending that arm, mm. and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Right. But and I think we both know that that's so much different in this way, because if Dean's like, okay, man, that's so multi-dimensional compared to like a white belt, tele- white belt telegraphing his moves, because Dean, okay, Dean, for example, he's like, I'm gonna get mount and I'm gonna do armbar, so him getting mount is gonna be all these little micro like things in there yeah not to mention the psychological war that he just waged on you and he's ahead by the way (laughs) so you got that and then you got all these little things when he goes for mount he's just gonna he's just gonna get mount so to get mount you got to do a certain you know thing in his case so when he does those things that's gonna be a bunch of those things that you're talking about all this thing i'm gonna fake this side but then i'm gonna go this side i'm gonna shift my weight so he shifts his weight that way so he so i go here so he so there's little mini things but he's just so good at it that he'll do, he can just do it like that. True. So I think, I mean, again, the the point there is like it's it's a lot different with a guy who Dean when he says I'm gonna get mount and I'm gonna armbar you, he's not telegraphing anything. He's telling you, sure, oh, but he's not technically point, yeah. telegraphing like like a white belt situation. But um, either way, I get it. Either way, I mean, everyone's different. Um, I do think that learning those steps and learning what a good, I think, getting that part down early on, early on, is is. I think more foundational. It's foundational. Once you start asking the question, why won't anyone tap to my moves? I need to set them up better. Here you go. Yeah. 
Yes, I think you're right about that. That's where you Dave's ever, at. You know, uh, to your point, how you could, when you want to do, so it's kind of like a feint, right, in boxing, maybe a little bit more, like how you say, I'm gonna, when I go for a move as a, as a setup move, yeah. you got to really sell that move. You got to yeah, really yeah. be going for that. So it's like bait, right? Bait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, you ever watch the movie Bait? No. Okay, so Bait is a movie with Jamie Foxx and, you know, some other people. Anyway, so one of the guys, it's... It's a long story. I don't want to. Do. So they're trying to catch this this gold thief, right? Okay. In bed. So this gold thief, but he's a real genius computer nerd gold thief, uh-huh. dude. And he's super good at hiding. The so, way you the way you pronounce that, you're like gold thief. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is a guy that's gold. He's he's a criminal, but he's like a computer guy, you got know. It, he's, it, but yeah. he's super genius, easy, like hides really well, and super hard to find, and all this stuff. And so the guy, the FBI guy, whoever, you know, the, the, the law enforcement dude, mm-hmm. he's like, hey, we got to set some bait. So this guy comes out mm-hmm. and gets the bait. But when you set bait, you can't be some fake thing. This bait has to be real. Like, a wolf, you know, when you try to catch a wolf, the bait has to be real. Yeah. It can't be just some bait you bought kind of kind of idea. So, you know, so the idea of the movie is they get this guy. <laughs> Jamie Foxx and they make him the bait but he doesn't know he's the bait because yeah. he has to be real has to be he can't be tainted with the human scent he got to be a real yeah. live piece of bait so that's essentially what your moves got to be absolutely you got to be like hey look if my bait is the arm lock if I'm going to bait the Kimura to get the sit up sweep that Kimura got to be a fresh plucked out of the wild Kimura attempt yep. and then when he goes and reacts to it or boom. bites it boom I get the sit up sweep same exact thing so yeah, they got us. the the setup uh, move. Got to smell real. Got to smell real. Check. That's how I like to keep all my moves smelling super real. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Check. Anyway, all right. Next question. Does discipline ever fail you? Does discipline ever fail you? No. Actually, discipline does not fail me. I fail discipline. That's what happens on days where I where I veer off the path and onto the slippery slope of weakness. It isn't discipline's fault. It's my fault. I'm the one that's being weak. I'm the one that's not holding the line. I'm the one that is deciding to take the short-term gratification instead of the long-term domination. When laziness creeps in, it's not it's not discipline that opened the door. It's me. It's me rationalizing and explaining and justifying that laziness. When I decide to take the easy path instead of the righteous path of discipline, that is my decision, that's all on me. It's me deciding to cave to my weaknesses and become a slave to them. And when I make that error, when I let discipline down, there's only one thing to do, and that's get back on the path. Get back on it. And then step it up and go harder and push more and pay for your transgressions. Cleanse yourself in the fire and the suffering of the discipline and get back on the path, the hard, unrelenting path of discipline, that path that leads to freedom. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. So, Echo? Yes. Speaking of the path against weakness, Sure. You know of any ways that maybe you could help us down that path? Yeah. First, I will talk about our company, Origin. Okay. What Origin does is a lot of stuff. Actually, impressive stuff. First thing they do, maybe not the first thing, but one of the many things they do is, I guess technically it's Origin Labs, right? Yeah. 
So Jocko has some supplements, Jocko Super Krill Oil, and Joint Warfare from Origin Labs. These supplements are for your joints. And of course, they're the best ones for your joints. Unless you made one that are not is not the best for your joints. No, we Did make you, the ones that are the best the for best your joints. The best one, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, someone tweeted at me. I think that's the, you tweet at someone, okay. right? That's the, the thing. Anyway, someone, they, they were like, hey, I ran out of joint warfare. Big mistake. Yeah, and he was, <laughs> it was kind of like just kind of expressing himself. Hey, man, I dig it because I've done that too that's why you get on the the subscription deal mm -hmm. yeah i think he did yeah lots of that that's a the joint warfare and the krill oil like try it yeah. if you if you if you have any joint issues at all try it seriously try it it will help you yeah it will absolutely help you which is awesome yeah and part of that which i did mention i think maybe last time there's anti-inflammatory stuff in there too like natural stuff, not yep. like ibuprofen or something like that, but like anti-inflammatory stuff. So that helps a lot. And, you know, I'm rarely like super impressed with, I mean, not like my standards are so high. I'm just saying like I understand <laughs> supplements are like, they're supplements, cool, I dig it kind of thing. But this is one that I was like, this is this is an important one, yeah. 100%. Don't run out. Just don't, don't run out. Also, discipline. Discipline is a what we are calling officially a pre- mission supplement so whatever your mission is physical mental emotional mm. sure <laughs> bro there's a thing called emotional intelligence yeah, i don't have emotions so i can't be yeah yeah you see talking yep. about that one i good don't know point. the effects on good that. point <laughs> put it this way i have never lost my temper i have never broke down and cried well that's debatable <laughs> while I'm on the discipline there you go so the proof is in the pudding so it is an emotional enhancing situation as well but whatever your mission is they, it's there's some nootropic stuff in there for cognitive enhancement and a little bit of caffeine if you're into caffeine a little bit microdose as we call it um, you know so that's a good one too don't run out also milk <laughs> Smoke is smoke. I had some the other day. Two scoops. What is so one good. serving? One one scoop. Right? Yeah, one serving okay. is one scoop. Milk protein powder. Mm, you know, okay. We'll 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 say protein, but you're well, just going with milk. Technically, technically yeah. it is right? right. But then you realize that technically, what it really is is milk. Milk. Yeah, you know what it is. I'll tell you. <laughs> What'd you, you mix it with? Milk. Oh, of course, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. What do we do? Mix it with water like a psycho. <laughs> You have you tried it with before? water though? No, it's no. actually not. I'm it's totally actually like I said the other day. It's not bad with water. Yeah. It's not bad. It's like satisfying. It's a ham sandwich, but it's yeah. not. It's not mint chocolate chip milkshake style. Yeah, yeah, like um, like on Crocodile Dundee, right? When he was like, um, he was like, yeah, you could live off it or what, you know. I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, about. like, sure, it's fine with he water. He was talking about milk? No, he was talking about, I don't forget what he was talking about. I recommend yeah. the milk. And, and you know what else? If you're, let's say you're lactose intolerant. Almond milk, no no problem. Almond milk, also awesome. Although, although they do make lactose-free milk now, which oh, is very similar tasting to regular milk. Like, surprisingly similar. Interesting. Because I accidentally bought some before. And I was drinking, I was like, I was like cool. But I was like... Is, does this taste different? Like, uh, you know, it's like a question. Yeah. It's not guaranteed. It could have been me. I, maybe I brushed my teeth too soon before I drank the milk. Ooh. You know, something like this. Ooh, foul. No, but you see, <laughs> see what I'm saying, though, right? You can do certain things that affects your little taste buds yeah. or whatever. It was like that. It was like, it was a question mark. It wasn't like, dang, I bought the wrong milk. Like, if you think you're drinking, I don't know, regular milk, but then it's like soy milk. Yeah. Or canned milk or powdered no, milk well, or something like this. Well, that couldn't be because it wouldn't be in my house. <laughs> in the rest of us, you know the difference. That's the point. You know the difference. Lactose-free milk and regular milk, like the difference isn't that obvious cool. in my opinion. So you give that one a try. Yeah, yeah, if you're lactose intolerant. But milk, nonetheless, technically is protein powder. You don't. This is why you don't like to say protein powder. Yeah, and we have, right now we only have mint, Chocolate but we have, we have peanut butter coming. Yeah. And the peanut butter is going to be the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jack. Yeah. This is what I'm. This chocolate is just, peanut butter, by the way. Yeah. Okay. And the mint isn't mint. It's, it's milk. Mint chocolate. Yeah. Mint chocolate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, protein powder makes it sound like what I'm saying before. The protein powder makes it sound like, oh, it's just one of these many protein powders that are out there kind of thing. No. That's the feeling you yeah, get. Yeah. That's but not the feeling you get when you drink milk. it. 
Yeah, it's smoke way different. Way different. If it would have not been milk, we would have called it protein powder. Yeah. But Choco it wasn't. Protein it was milk. powder. Yep. <laughs> with the with the, the Umlaut. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was like some Viking thing. The way it's you're a heavy saying metal it. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Hardcore. Heavy metal. It's a, it's a heavy metal thing. Like when you go I, I this, talked like, about this. Yeah, it's I know. Blue Oyster Cult. This That's is one of the first m- the first album that had it was Blue Oyster Cult. And okay. then probably the most the most famous that has it is Motorhead. And that's because the two fingers, that, Just, you know, like rock I, on. I know. I, 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 I re- before I released this, I researched it. That's how I know this. All right. And cool. and Lemmy from Motorhead's quote as to why he used the umlaut was because he said it looks mean. That's his quote. That's all that's he said. That's it. Yep. No big philosophical representation of like, well, they represent eyes. That no are layers. Seeing no. No. There's a layer. There's layers it looks now. Mean. Yeah, yeah. I Lemmy said you. it looks mean. What? Yeah. What do you say to Lemmy? Disagree with him? Yeah, no, it like, doesn't hey, look mean. Sounds cool to me, Lemmy. Yeah, and then now it's on the milk. Those are layers. That's layers. So you provi- provided another layer. It has been turned into layers. And also, you know how you say rock on, like I said, well, this is what I thought. You know, when you say rock on, and you have the two fingers, right? Yeah, Point, index horns, finger, yeah. and the, you know, and the pinky, boom, rock on. If you were to, I don't know. By the way, people don't say rock on anymore. <laughs> well, I don't know, bro. I'm not in the scene. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, you know, you do that motion and let's say you had some, I don't know, some chalk or something on your hand uh-huh. from doing deadlifts or something like this. And then you touch the wall, boom, you got your umlaut right there. That's what I thought it for real was. That's interesting. My name is Echo. <laughs> you're, way, you're way too creative or your mind is wandering a little too much. I think other people might have thought that too. Think about this. Okay, my name is Echo, obviously. It's my real name, by the way. I have a twin brother named Jade. He's older by 15 minutes. So I'm the second twin, right? Yeah. Follow? So my first grade teacher was, she said, oh, yeah, your name's Echo. That makes sense now because you're the Echo. your brother's Echo. Yeah. See what I'm saying? And I was like, dang, that is, man, my parents are, are smart. Yeah. No, creative. I thought that too. And they didn't yeah. tell me the truth. Yeah. So I go home and I ask and my mom was like, wow, no, not at all. I just thought it was cool. Same thing as Lemmy. Yeah. Same exact thing. She just thought it was mean. No, not mean. Just, Echo. just cool and, and how should I say, like euphoric. My mom's a hippie. Anyway, back to the milk. It's dope. Peanut butter, chocolate, not out yet, but we'll be out yep. soon. Look forward to that one big time. Also, strangely, are you is peanut butter chocolate your second favorite flavor? Um I don't know. It's Pete's, by the way. It's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's mine, by Pete, the way. <laughs> Pete sent me like a text when he first got the peanut butter one. And I could tell that he was real fired up. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> he, he was. Re- he had a real. Str- he's like. He's like. Just mix this up. You know, it's like a little thing. He's like, just mix this up. Only, and he, you know, you see the thing leave the screen, and then he slams it back down. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. <laughs> see, see, that's so, a yeah. good sign, right? Yeah, there. yeah. The, the and guy then, making and it. Yeah. It's kind of a pain because then he has to take it, and because they only give you one sample. So then he FedExes. He's like FedEx. I'm like, send me the rest. Yeah, he's yeah, like, it's yeah. on. It's in route. You so. got to break it up, like um, like in little bags. It's so good. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, be on the lookout for that. If you care, if you if you want some milk, be on the lookout for that. Also. Geese and rash guards is what Origin has. Again, originmain.com. This stuff is all made in America, by the way. Side note. Or that's is that even a side, side note? note. <laughs> yeah, that's the note straight up. Note, note this. All this made in America. So geese and rash guards. Geese. Okay, why is that relevant? Because we talked about jujitsu today. Everyone still, not everyone, people still ask me weekly, maybe even bi-weekly, what geese should I get? Point me in a direction of a good geese. Here, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. Origin. Geese, whichever one you want, whichever two you want, whichever three you yeah. want. They're good people, geese. Hey, people that missed the original deaf gi, the Discipline Freedom gi, yeah, that says get after it on the sure. on the tail. Sure, what it's called the skirt. I've heard skirt. it called the skirt, the tail. Anyways, the back of the the back of the gi top yeah. on the bottom. It says get after it. But they originally made those, or we originally made those as a like you know kind of like a. Like a what tribute, yeah, signature. Um, no, just uh, uh, what's that word? Like special only. Yeah, yeah. Special There's, edition. Yeah, special, special ed- edition. Anyways, but everyone liked them, and so now they're part of the part of the line. Dang, part of the line. Part of the yeah, line. they're good. Yeah, I noticed the white one is available now, and so is the black. Okay, yeah, they're both up. Boom, whatever color you want. Also, another question people ask about the geese. They're like, hey, what color should I get? Like, is it crazy to get a green gi or something like this, right? 
you know, the, do people ask you that still? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. So, yeah, so it's people the, seem to come to you more for gi. It's probably more of a fashion like thing that they, so they go to you. Maybe. And well, yeah, well, the origin geese looked dope too, by the way. And that's not just because you mentioned fashion. They do. That's like one of the, one of the. Well, Pete's got a little fashion streak. In yes, him, he does. Yeah. You don't like that. Actually, no, that's good that he does because you don't. So yeah, it's no, like I, a know, perfect I have compliment. No fa- I have no fashion streak. Situation. My fashion streak is t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. Give me a t-shirt. In other words, no fashion streak. Nonetheless, the colors of the geese are going to depend on your instructor. Or your academy. True. So true. these, you know, like if your academy allows whatever color gi you want, like victory does, then you, whatever color you want. Then you kind of go into this game within the game, which actually doesn't really exist, really. And that's like, if you're a new guy and you show up with a pink gi or a, or a crazy, like, you know, those weird gis and a gold belt or something. You know how Jeff Glover used to wear that gold belt? Yeah. Or was it Frangia who did that? They both did. Anyway, yeah. Bill Cooper even. If you do that, then it's like, hey, you know, but this more that's more of like social fabric kind of thing. But if it comes down to the the, the school. So some rigid schools only white. Yeah. Some rigid schools. And then the more traditional is like white or blue. That's it. Mm-hmm. Don't do a green, don't do a black, which are cool in my opinion. And then you get the schools where like, eh, whatever. Yeah. And maybe there's in between. I never heard of any, but maybe there's an in between. So point there, ask your instructor, what color? Then boom, get that color. OriginMain.com. That's the deal. Also, rash guards on there. Good rash guards, by the way. All made in America. The sweats, I always say, are the most comfortable sweats I've ever had Mm -hmm. and used. Still on that. Still is. (laughs) Held up. I did a little competition. Kind of impromptu. Yeah, the joggers. Um this past week and still yeah holds up and I have some comfortable sweats I know about comfort I do I'm not a stranger to comfort anyway go there originmain.com good spot also if you want to vary up your workout and get new workout equipment go to onit.com slash Jocko get yourself some kettlebells the artistic kettlebells, I call them artistic kettlebells, but I don't think there's the word artistic on the whole website, by the way. Mm-hmm. So it's like primal bells. That's like the, you know, the monkey groups, gorillas, <laughs> orangutan, you know, those things. They're artistic kettlebells. Then there's like zombie bells and werewolves and whatnot. Anyway, I say get those. They're the dopest. Um, but there's some other good stuff, maces and battle ropes and whatnot. If you want to vary up the workout. You know, good. A lot of good info too on there. So, you know, if you ask me about what to do with kettlebells when you're first starting out, like well, how much you should use or how much weight you should use and what movements, I'm not the resource. I'm not that versed in it. I know two movements, three, eh, maybe four altogether, but there's a bunch going on it. Dot com slash Choco. That's the spot. Good spot. Get something. Also, when you are purchasing any of the books that Jocko reviews, or even Extreme Ownership, or Way of the Worry Kid, or whatever, whatever book. I organized them all on jockopodcast.com. Books from the episodes. Actually, Jocko's books are on the front page, but for the books they review, re review on the podcast, books from episodes, boom, they're all right there. Click through there when you buy those books. It's a good way to support. And, uh, you know, carry on. Do your shopping. It'll take you to Amazon, by the way. But yeah, get your books through there. It's a good way to support. Also, Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. Now there's a lot of podcast apps out there. Whatever app you're using for your podcast, subscribe. Good way to support. Leave a review if you're in the mood. That's what I say. Jocko says, you know, if you're not in the mood, do it anyway. You know, because you're not always going to be in the mood. You know, that whole yeah, thing. true. But whatever. To me, that's up to you. Leave a review. That's cool. They're funny to read. Thank you for them. Yes, they're funny to read. A lot of layers in a lot of those. <laughs> so that's yep. I like seeing creative layers layers in the reviews. Yeah. I I feel like the people have gotten a very strong hold and understanding of the concept of layers. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and they've a been demonstrated. Same with Amazon reviews for stuff. Yeah. yeah. There too. <laughs> yes. Salute to that one big time. Also on YouTube, subscribe if you haven't already. The video version of this podcast along with excerpts little I don't know two, anywhere from two to eight minutes excerpts Big and excerpts. some enhanced excerpts on there as well put some music on there make them 
funner, we'll say, to watch on YouTube. Maybe some outtakes every once in a great while. Anyway, there's, if you're interested in the video situation, subscribe to YouTube. It's a good way to support. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. This is where you can get all your Jocko gear, like Discipline Equals Freedom shirts and hoodies, rash guards, some women's stuff on there. Tank tops. How do we feel about tank tops? Uh, I feel great. Just in general. Good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to make some? I think so. Cool, do it. Yeah. Have them for summertime. Yeah. Let's go. Rock and roll. I feel like I haven't worn a tank top for like probably since like like college time. Oh, well. But I mean, yeah, that's not, not a fact. I mean, what, cause, but I'm just saying as far as like what I day to day think Man, about. Man, when it gets hot, it's so nice to have a tank top on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. I agree. So yeah. So tank tops. Yeah. Be on the... I always find it not strange, but I always don't want to say be on the lookout for that. Like it's this big thing. You got to be on the lookout. But, uh, kind, you know, if you're down for the tank tops, hey, <laughs> be on the lookout for it, I guess. Right. Check. Nonetheless, JockoStore.com. You can get some patches. I got some Warrior Kid patches. Nice. Got, so those should be on there right now, actually, for the Warrior Kids and the geese and geese. the gi, the backpack, wherever you want to put that one. You don't represent where your kids. Also, other patches on there too. Discipline equals freedom and whatnot. Also, psychological warfare. If you don't know what that is, it's an album with tracks, Jocko tracks that help you through every moment of weakness that you might come across. Because not because apparently not all of us go through moments of weakness. It's rare, but some people they just power through. For those types of people, psychological warfare not for them. I think. I think they just power through and continue powering through. Maybe even teach us how to just power through. But for the rest of us, we hit moments of weakness. We listen to psychological warfare, given what the weakness is. So if my weakness is hitting the snooze and not getting up early, there's a track for that. It's Jocko on that track talking to you, telling you why you should get up. Not yelling. He's playing the game, quote unquote. Mm. Actually, he's not technically playing the game on a track. Just, he's just flanking. Just I don't explaining. know. Yeah, just explaining pragmatically, like why the say, value. You could say that it is a little bit of a flank going on because it's getting everyone that listens to it. Like it hits the spot, right? Yes. It nails the target. Yeah. Of why? Because I know where the weakness comes from. It yeah. happens to me. Yeah. And so I just talk about how you just overcome that thing. Yeah, huh? Because technically, the very reason, or by the very nature of you wanting to stay in bed, that's by its very nature a reinforced position. Because you're you're rationalizing in your head. You're defending your actions or your potential actions. You're defending that already in your own head. So here comes Jocko on the Jocko track. You you don't attack those things. You just come around and say, Hey, hey I take it. <laughs> you know, the the bed is, I dig it. You know, all this stuff. You flank. It's good. Yeah. And that, there's a track for all these little weaknesses. Good. 100% effectiveness, by the way. Get it on iTunes or wherever. Wherever you can buy MP3s. It's on, like, Amazon Music and whatnot as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of Amazon, if you want to get something called Jocko White Tea, you can get that on Amazon. You should only get it if you want to have an 8,000-pound deadlift because that's what it results in. Otherwise, drink some other tea. <laughs> yep. Now, this is cool. We have Jocko White Tea in a can coming out in June on Amazon. Get some. Obviously, the goal is to eventually get them out at retail so you can have that option everywhere you go instead of drinking the junk energy drinks that are bad for you. Uh, so, yeah, I'll let, it, I'll let you all know when it hits Amazon. It's been made, by the way, if you're wondering. Um, a ton of it, a bunch of it, way more than a ton, actually. <laughs> a lot of it has been made. Yeah. Because I think, well, I know I want it. So, it, it, worst case scenario, I have a lifetime supply of, of Jocko White tea in a can. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, you know, I don't know what else. Well, there's a little debate, you know, what should we call it? Mm-hmm. You know? Wait, what should you call what? The Jocko White tea. Because I was kind of thinking, well, there's another name we could give it. We could call it 8,000 pound deadlift in a can. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. But no, we're still calling it Jocko White Tea. Hey, yeah. books. Way the Warrior Kid. Tons. The series, right? There's two books out right now. And so much awesome feedback on that. It's awesome. Thanks for posting pictures of your kids studying, reading, doing book reports, training jujitsu, working out. It's awesome to see. Thank you. And if you have kids or you know kids 
get them on that same path. If you want to support a warrior kid, go to irishoaksranch.com and get some soap made by the warrior kid, Aiden, because you know you need soap if you are going to stay clean. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about the Discipline Equals Freedom field manual. Same thing, awesome feedback. You ever heard the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away? Yes. Not really. (laughs) Read one section of the field manual a day. I know it doesn't rhyme, but it actually works. (laughs) It'll keep you on track physically and mentally and if you want to speaking of tracks if you want to listen to it There's no audio audible version of it because we wanted to have an album with tracks You can get it on Amazon music Google Play iTunes other mp3 platforms The discipline equals field the discipline equals freedom field manual meditate on that (laughs) All right. Also, for leadership, extreme ownership, combat leadership, how is this book still a bestseller after two and a half years? That's the question. And Leif was telling a guy the other day on Twitter, he's like, it's the same thing as when we first started working together and I talked to him about something and how to do something. And he'd be like, yeah, it works. And that's why the book is still selling because it works. And, and right now, speaking of it works, you can order the follow-on book to Extreme Ownership. It's called The Dichotomy of Leadership. The manuscript is done. It is now going through the Pentagon review process. And I'm telling you, Leif and I are both super stoked on the information that's in it, the stories that are in it, the word that's in it. You can pre-order it now from anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, and if you do that, it lets our publisher know how many to print. Because otherwise they don't know. And you know what they're trying to do? Saving money. So they're not going to print enough. And then you'll be all bummed because you didn't get a copy when it comes out September 25th. And if you need close air support for the leadership at your team, contact Echelon Front. It's my leadership and consulting company. Me, Leif Babin, J.P. Dinell, Dave Burke. The website is echelonfront.com. We solve problems through leadership. There you go. Just, that's what we do. Just, I've been working with a lot of different companies last, the last, well, for a while, but I just went through a bunch of meetings. And it's like, yeah, you look at all these problems that they have, they're all leadership problems. And that's how we solve problems, through leadership. Of course, if you wanna come to the muster, then it's our leadership seminar. The one in DC sold out, sorry. I'm telling you they sell out, they've all sold out so far. So if you want the opportunity to come to a muster, there's only one more in 2018. It is the muster 006 in San Francisco, California, October 17th and 18th. Register at extremeownership.com before it sells out and we have to say no. That does not feel good. But there's fire codes and we have firefighters there. (laughs) So we can't just pack people in. Also for current military, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders who are holding the roll call number one, September 21st in Dallas, Texas. It's a one day leadership training seminar specific to dynamic and hostile environments that military, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, first responders have to work in. You can also register for that at extremeownership.com. And until the muster or Roll call or the immersion camp up in Maine. We'll see at one of those. But until then, if you want to ask us questions or you want to give us answers, you can find us on the interwebs. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And to all the military personnel in uniform out there worldwide keeping evil on lockdown, thank you for what you do. Thanks to the police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and all first responders for staying prepared and staying vigilant and staying ready to answer the call to keep us safe here on the home front and to everyone else out there with us trying to stay on the path of discipline instead of walking down the slippery slope of despair. Stay focused, stay strong, stay disciplined, and keep getting after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.